what else this group is for pretty much everyone so we talk a lot about agile for obvious reasons um but if you're new to agile if you love it if you hate it if you're in between it really doesn't matter what you do or how you do it um we just like to have an open and honest discussion um and a bit of a knowledge share as well so thank you so much uh, for joining us um so just a very quick uh, things. We are going to be recording this session, so I think this is the cue to record. Uh, thank you, Ines. Um, we are going to be here for around about an hour and a half, so a 90 minute time box. Um, and please utilize the chat uh, that we have um, in the meetup as well to get conversations going. But also, if you have questions or anything like that, then please feel free just to speak up as well. Uh, we would welcome that. Um, Ines will be uh, well, Ines is my co-host um, for the Agile Meetup, so I will let you introduce yourself for people who have not met you before. Hello everyone, so yes, Ines Garcia over here. I wear many hats, I'm a Salesforce MVP, an Agile coach, a Scrum Master, uh, you name it. And yeah, this is one of my recent adventures, so really happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Ennis, and I probably should have introduced myself. I am Helen Garcia. Um, I am the other co-host here. Uh, again, we just thought we would uh, set this time up so that we can share and you know share knowledge and all sorts. I'm a Scrum Master, um, and I do a number of other things for a lot of uh, clients in the States. Um, OK, so we're going to warm our fingers up <laughs> by playing rock, paper, scissors. Um, I am a massive fan of rock, paper, scissors. I use it at least once a week with all my scrum teams. I love it because it's interactive. I can see people, gets people moving. Um, and it's super simple. You can use it for decision making and pretty, pretty much anything I've discovered. I mean, in my opinion. Um, so I basically just have four questions for you. Super easy. You're going to show me a rock for a yes. Show me a paper for maybe you're not quite sure and show me scissors this way around, please, um, for a no. So I'd love to see, love to see your rocks. Can I see your best rocks? Amazing. Awesome. Um, scissors, throw you off a bit. Scissors, pull wrong way around, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and a paper, that was paper cool. We're all familiar with the game. Excellent, lovely, you're looking great. Okay, so the first question then. Hopefully an easy one. I Who have a request. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. If you stop sharing the screen, we can see each other. Oh. So we need to be in gallery view, right? Oh, it's all right, it's me, Thank you. yeah. Yeah, got it. Oh, cool. Oh yeah, and I could have been in gallery view as well. Um, great, so I can see your lovely faces now, even better. You can draw right. some... Uh... Um, some mountains as well, if you wish. I can do what, sorry? And try to give a bit of snow on them. I'm not quite catching it, but great idea. A rock. Yes. Um, okay, cool. So my first question is, who's excited to be here tonight? Awesome. I'm glad all the people I can't see them. That's okay. I'm sure you're showing a rock. Um, my next question is, who knows what improv is? Mm. Okay, we've got some no's, we've got some unsure's. That's good. Thank God Paul is here then. It's uh, very good news. And for those rocks that were out right. there. I, I think I missed... Is one for yes, one's for maybe, and one's for no? Yeah, the rock is a strong oh. yes, a paper is a maybe, and a scissors is a no. I figured the scissors are more... I missed that bit somehow. Okay, that's okay. Maybe, I may not have said it, but I, I <laughs> think I may have. Um, so for all those rocks out there, sorry, who actually uses like improv at work or at home or anywhere in between those two variables that we all have in our life? Just me. <laughs> Just you. Well, okay. <laughs> and Karina has got a scissors. She doesn't use it in there either, but that's okay. That's good that we have you. Okay, then um, a tricky one, a bit of a, whether it's a ham or pineapple pizza, I'd like to ask is, is Thursday the new Friday? Yeah, we've got some no's. Yes. 
So great. Just curious, really, because everybody's so um, so confused about that element. Anyway, <laughs> that's it, really. So you're nice and warmed up. Um, next up, then, if you have uh, not heard of Paul Gollett, he is a great man. I've um, had the pleasure of uh, being on some training session, well, one training session with you, actually, uh, which was absolutely fantastic um, and very inspiring. I've actually stolen maybe a couple of things from that, um, but uh, I know <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be saying copyright. Uh, but um, yeah, really interesting, very inspiring. And uh, you're um, a great great person to have on this and a really interesting topic in regards to like um, improving our uh, improv. I've got no idea really how it all works. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear um, um, your, your knowledge sharing on that topic. Um, another amazing thing that uh, Mr. Goddard has done, he has written a book. I'm gonna reshare my screen. Oh no, I don't need to, we have a prop. How amazing. <laughs> um, uh, improving or improv agile teams, uh, which I think Ines, you'd like to say a couple of words. Um, um, of course, I can. I, I highly recommend this. I will ping a, a, a blog in the chat in a minute. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. And not only that, you guys need to read it until the end, and then it will open your mind about the beginning. Uh... That really blew my mind. And well done, Paul. Like <laughs> it must have been hard. So. <laughs> Yeah, can't give away the Easter egg at the end. And uh -huh. yeah, not, not, not yet, at least. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Thank you. So the sales should go up. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, great. So I'd just like to then introduce you over to uh, Paul. And thanks again for um, being here tonight. That's all right. No problem at all. <laughs> thanks, Helen. And, and thanks, Ines. Thanks for the lovely introductions. Um, these things are really nice to uh, to do anyway, even before uh, COVID and lockdown. These things were always a, a joy to be part of. And it's great that you can carry on these kind of uh, community events in a more virtual sense. And I think the benefit is that you can extend it to a much wider audience. So whatever you're doing, it's great and, and keep doing it and keep and hopefully these events will just get bigger and bigger. So um, anything I can do to help is uh, is always a good thing. Um, Good evening for, from, from, from me, from the UK. I'm not sure where you all are, but um, we might find out as we go through this. Um, I think I've got about 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes of, uh, of material to get through, uh, which is largely going to take the form of games that you're going to play with me, uh, hopefully. And by, by doing that, hopefully I'll get some of the principles of, of improvisation across um, via this Zoom format. Um, like I say, all of these things are kind of optional to a degree. Um, I'm not going to force you to play any game you don't want to play. Um, but it would be great if you could play along. And the benefit of Zoom is that we have cameras and we even have microphones um, that allow us to interact with each other. So I'm going to test you now and to see... I can see a lot of cameras and faces. Wave at me if you can see me. I can see you on camera. But there's lots of people I can't see. And I'd really like you to turn your cameras on if you can. There we go. There's some more people. Wave away. Hello. Any more people with cameras that are just, hello, Karina, I know you've got a camera, so you can turn yours on. There she is. <laughs> Good stuff. So a lot of these games are going to be camera-based games. So the more um, you turn your camera on, the more you can play. And there's going to be some games that are much more microphone-based, so we might need you to have your microphones on at some point as well. I'll try and give you a bit of a heads up as to when that might be. All right, let me um, share my, uh, my screen with you now. Uh, here's a picture of me uh, before lockdown, before I my I need when I didn't need a haircut. Now look at the state of that now. Yeah, I was looking quite tidy there, but uh, for that Photoshop, it's all gone downhill since then. Um, so yeah, this this um, short session now is based on uh, the five elements of my book, um, and the reason I wrote the book was really because I'm a huge fan of, of improvisation, but also I realised there's a huge crossover between improvisation in terms of the dramatic arts and also agile development. And there's a, a huge advantage that agile teams can gain from improv principles and vice versa. So they are quite closely aligned, more so than you might think. Um, a bit of a, some, some trying to set a bit of a safe space if we can, to a degree. 
So the words improvisation, a lot of you mentioned there, or sorry, I saw, not a lot of people have done it before or even aware of what it is all about. Um, if you've seen any improvisation on stage or on TV or on, on, uh, on, um, at the theatre, wherever it might be, then you'll probably associate it with comedy. Um, and that's the first kind of myth to put to bed, really, that improvisation wasn't really founded in comedy. It started in, in slightly different guise, but it's probably the most common uh, way that we see improvisation. But it's not the only way that improvisation is used. And there's a lot of other applications of improv that I'll go through today. So you, it's not a prerequisite here for you to tell jokes. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you, put you on the spot and ask you to tell jokes. That's not what today's all about. Equally, improv is not about being creative or particularly original. Uh, a lot of people think that improvisers can make things up on the spot. That's large, true to a degree, but there's a lot of constraints and a lot of discipline in place to help improvisations be creative and to, and to think on the spot. It's more about your adaptiveness on the spot. And the thirdly is that it's all about being chaotic. The appearance that improvis improvisational actors have on stage is that they're just making it up as they go along. That may well be true, but what's in place is actually a lot of very simple constructs and constraints that allow them to work in that way. A lot of the creativity comes from those constraints. Okay, so that's the kind of the, the prerequisites. A bit of the history before I get into a game. Improvisation comes initially from a, a lady called Viola Spolin. And she wrote, um, she was actually a teacher. She used to teach uh, young immigrant children uh, English as a, as a kind of a second language. So she was a lot of the improv games that Viola Spolin created were there to, to aid storytelling in young children and to allow them to communicate more effectively. And that's kind of where it started in, um, in the United States. And that was taken by her son-in-law, I believe, um, uh, a man who actually took the improv theory into comedy theatre. So that's where Second City Theatre Company started in Chicago, very much trying to grow that, um, that comedy genre from improvisation, improvisation on stage. I took most of my inspiration for my book and my training and how I work as an agile coach from a man called Keith Johnston, who's there on the, on the right with me there, pre-beard pre uh, in that photo. Uh, but me, I, I was on one of Keith's workshops back in 2014 and he was an inspiration to me in terms of his passion for improv, but also just for teaching people how to be comfortable with uncertainty. So that's where I did really see a huge crossover. A lot of improv, improv is about being comfortable with uncertainty and seeing change as a positive thing, which you could argue is exactly what being agile is all about. Okay, so like I say, I'll attempt as best I can in the time that I've got to give you a bit of a experience of these five different elements of my book here. Five different uh, aspects of improv that all relate to, to being agile in terms of how I coach it and how I try and go about my personal and professional life. Safety, spontaneity, storytelling, status and sensitivity. I've tried to pull together a little bit of an agenda here tonight to give you a little bit of a flavour of most of those elements in some way, shape or form, to give you a little bit of ex exposure to that. So we're going to start with safety. And again, this is a game we can do on, on Zoom. And if you, if you would like to read more about this, I will try and make these slides available to you at the end of the um, this session, somewhere online that you can go and, and download these or view, at least view them. So this is a game called Anyone Who. It's a nice game that we can play with Zoom as well. You can do this interactively. And in this game, players will state facts about themselves which may unco uncover some similarity with, with other players. Players will start their fact with the words, anyone who. And they kind of fill in the blank. They fill in the rest of the sentence. We can all start the game with our cameras off and players can, turn, can start by switching their camera on. So if, if you match... If you share that fact with the speaker, you also turn your camera on. All right, that's all I'm going to ask you to do. You just have to play the game by playing along. If, you're, if you match or share that fact with the person who's speaking, just turn your camera on. We'll have a little bit of a walk through this as a group, uh, and I'll try and I'll play these games with you so you can very much see how these go. So... Uh, we've got someone in the waiting room. They're, they're all, we're all in, are we? and we should be able. But to... even if, even if you are coming to Amsterdam, and 
No, I'm definitely not going to Amsterdam. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> you need to be in gallery view for this to work really well. I've, I've, I've um, expanded my screen. I can see all of you on the same screen now, I think. But I need to see your cameras on. So just to make sure your cameras are working, everyone just turn your cameras on. Bottom left hand of the screen, make sure your cameras are working. There we go, awesome. Savar, are you there? Can you hear us? Camera on, Carolina, Xavier, Perry. I'm there, but I cannot put it on, sorry. Oh, okay, you'll just have to spectate, I'm afraid, for this game. Then. Absolutely. Okay, um, right, so this is how it works. We're all gonna turn our cameras back off, or all the cameras off. Well, I'll do that as well. Cameras off. There we go, very good. We'll get used to doing that, cameras off. Right, so if I start this, I'll turn one with the, the, the camera on. So I'll start this game. And I would start it with but saying, anyone who has been outside for a walk in the fresh air today, that's my anyone who. If that, if you're, if that is true of you, you can turn your camera on and I can see who else has also been out for a walk in the fresh air today. Brilliant, okay, perfect. So now um, I'll turn my camera back off. And if anyone else would like to start another anyone who, they can turn their camera on and they can turn their, their microphone on and they can share that with us now. You're on a mute, Helen, that's it. <laughs> Failed. Um, is there anyone who has done a 15 minute jog inside today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got one person. And Mary's oh, one. Mary, nice. Very good. Nice. Okay. Excellent. So, thank you very much. Turn your cameras back off, and we'll see if someone else would like to join in with a new anyone who. Anyone else like to have a go? Turn your camera on if you want to join in. Okay, we. Uh, one of you going to start. Don't mind who it is. Mary's got a hand up. Go with Mary then. Sorry. <laughs> anyone who's had two cups of coffee today? Oh yes. Oh, lots of us, lots of us. <laughs> Brilliant, Mary, excellent, well done. And camera's back off. Who'd like to go next? I would like to go next. Go on then, Anna. Anyone who has a cat? Anyone who has a cat? Oh, and the cat's on camera. Just two of us, just two cats <laughs> amongst us. Three cats. <laughs> That counts, Helen, that's fine. Great, thanks. Well done, Anna, good stuff. Camera's back off again. Anyone who ate a sandwich for lunch? <laughs> yes, I did. Good oh, stuff. Just the two. Anyone who watched Netflix last night? Oh. Yeah, I think Netflix is doing a lot of business right now, isn't it? Good stuff. Thanks, Christos. We'll have a couple more. Right, Ivan. Anyone who has been on more than two Zoom calls today? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Good question. As long as WebEx counts, we don't use Zoom at work, but <laughs> I'm counting that. Yeah, that still counts. And a couple more then. Anyone else want to join in? Maru. Anyone who's meditated more than once this past week? Say again, I, I missed the beginning. Anyone who's meditated more than once? This meditated more than once. Excellent, thank you. And let's have one more then, one more from someone else who hasn't joined in yet. Hello? You're on mute at the moment, my friend. Uh, anyone made some money today? Made some money? Yeah, <laughs> earned some money. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Good stuff. And you can turn your cameras back on. That's the end of the game. Give yourselves a, 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 a silent round of applause for yourself. Well done. 
What I normally do is, uh, when I'm training these games, and I kind of uh, we play the game very much, uh, very much like that, and then I just play it back to you. What does that? What are you noticing? What are you reflecting on? What are you learning from a game like that? Anyone got anything to add? What are you learning about a game like that? Interaction and uh, engagement. Interaction and engagement. Good. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I feel closer to some people from here, easier and get connected. Yeah, so getting closer to people, building relationships, possibly learning a little bit more about other relative strangers on the same call. Anything else? Um, whatever, what do people think about first when you frame, when you give them a particularly tight, tightly framed question? Okay. So some of them think about money, some of them think about books. <laughs> Yeah, possibly. So yeah, maybe learning a little bit about each other, about what, kind of what what's on our mind, possibly. My question would also be, what's this got to do with safety? Uh, social safety. Say again? Social safety. Okay, tell us more what group. you mean by that. Yeah, uh, that uh, we can uh, easily interact with each other and uh, in a safe way, so to speak. Instead yeah. of uh, not saying anything or do anything. So. Yeah, so it's very much an optional join in. I'm not forcing anyone here, hopefully, to, to play the game that doesn't want to. So that creates safety in itself. But the questions uh, are hopefully... Finding... Oh, sorry, Mary. <laughs> Finding something in common. Yeah. So particularly in, when we're talking about scrum teams or agile teams, we're trying to build that safety. We're trying to build common ground. And when we've got common ground, we can generally start to build trust. Okay, so we're tr this is a very much a and rapport, as people are mentioning there in the chat window, learning to share and rapport, very much trying to common experiences. That's what's going to be what binds us together, what, what brings us together, what allows us to connect. And that's really what safe, where safety is, is, uh, is founded. So if I go back, I had a couple of slides on this I wanted to share with you, I think. Um, which is this one, which is a, a, a diagram that you've probably seen before at some point in time. And I credit um, Patrick Lencioni with this, the, from the five dysfunctions of a team. Some of you nodding on that, you will have seen this before. But this was a, um, obviously a, a big influence for me in terms of what safety means and building that trust and psychological safety. What the, these teams that really do feel um, part of a, of, of a team that's, that's, and they feel safe within that team. And Lencioni talks about the core dysfunction of teams is this absence of trust right at the bottom of that diagram there, the bottom of that triangle. And what we're also trying to hoping to expose with this an exercise like this is a little bit of vulnerability. Because if we can get if we if we can all admit to something that we're perhaps that we've done wrong or that we're not particularly proud of, maybe a, a flaw in our character. That is where we generally start to build trust from. Common, gr common ground is great, but where you tend to get real um, trust and, 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 um, and you can build a relationship is where you admit that you're not perfect. So one of the ways that I use this game as, with me as a facilitator is sometimes I might, I'm trying to, trying to build trust by leading by example. Uh, and trying to maybe I might go in there with an, anyone who um, is you know, kind of suffering with with a bit of anxiety about the current work situation or the current um, health situation, their, their mental health situation, whatever it might be. So trying to expose a little bit of weakness in myself might be allow other people in my scrum team to actually admit that they're suffering with a similar thing. They don't actually have to say it. All they might need to do is to turn their camera on and the rest of us can see it without them having to actually explicitly say it. And it just give, gives people permission to feel vulnerable. And as a leader within an agile team, that might be sometimes the best thing we can do is give people permission to feel vulnerable, that it's okay to be not to be okay. Okay. Good. That's the exercise number one. But hopefully, um, yeah, it's, it's that element of safety, trying to build on this sense of safety. Let's have a look at uh, some spontaneity. This is uh, episode two. And this is very much the, uh, the basis, um, the, the, uh, the ethos really that improv is built upon. 
this idea of yes and. Um, you won't notice improvisers doing this explicitly on stage, but they're generally advised, and Keith Johnston uh, very much told me, to look for an opportunity to say yes rather than say no. Accept what you're given okay, on, on stage and accept what we're, what we're given in areas of uncertainty. And something might, positive might, might come of it. Okay, And it's very much um, trying to, I've, I've labelled this, observing with intent. So we're accepting what was said, but we're also trying to, the intention is to increase and add to it and add to, to the scene or add to the context that we're given. It's the basic unit of currency that improvisers, improvisers work with. Okay. So what I'm going to get you to do, I'm going to give you a quick example of this. If I come back off this screen slightly stop sharing that um, I wanted to give you an example of what uh, improvisers work with in terms of being spontaneous in terms of um, the basic unit of currency that they'd be working with on stage um, and it's called an offer okay so improvisers work a lot with something called an offer I was going to try and describe this to you by virtue of playing a scene in front of the camera um, by, by playing two actors, and this is terrible theatre, but, but bear with me on my terrible theatre, okay? So how improvisation works is an act, two actors would be on stage, let's say, and they'd call out to the audience for the name of a location. And let's say, for argument's sake, they, that the audience shouts out, hospital, all right? They need a location to set their scene. It's, they've said hospital. Two actors on stage, I'll try and play both of them, bear with me. The first actor says to their fellow actor, they've got hospital in the back of their mind, the first actor says, good morning, doctor, all right? That's an offer, three words, good morning, doctor. Can you spot the yes and within that? Because the first offer was actually from the audience. What was that offer, do you remember? To do a hospital. Hospital, the word hospital, the location was the offer. Where's the yes and in good morning, doctor? Yes, I'm doing the hospital, but I'm adding the doctor. Right, and how did we, how did we yes it? What was the yes? Good morning. It's not necessarily the good morning. It's a, a, scene, a doctor would be at a, a doctor. hospital. Yeah, it's establishing doctor. We've also added here the time of day. And we've added, we've tried to set a role here mm. that you're going to play the doctor. So, so play that back, hospital shouted out, good morning, doctor. The other actor says, good morning, nurse. Where's the yes and there? Good morning, nurse. Nurse. Nurse is, is adding something back to, to a doctor. We're establishing another role in the same hospital. And the yes is good. I'm agreeing with you. It's good morning. OK, so that's kind of the basis of where a scene might start. No script, no uh, pre no prearranged uh, ideas about who's going to be what role. And there's no discussion. It's just go with it. Three words met with another three words. We've got a scene that's starting in a hospital. The other thing that improvisers play around with is what we call a block. And I'll just demonstrate what a block is. So hospital comes out of the audience. Hospital. Good morning, doctor. I'm not a doctor. That's what you, in improv terms, that's what you call a block. There was no acceptance of the time of day or even that there was a hospital because the person has just said, I'm not a doctor. Now think about it, if you're on stage, you're the actor that's had, I'm not a doctor, that's come back to you. What are you, what are you uh, prepared to do? What, what, what happens now? What's, that, what's the emotion you're going to experience? Uncertainty. Sorry? Uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. Stress, anxiety. Oh my God, I've got to think of something really cool now because I'm suggesting you're a doctor, but you're not a doctor. How the hell are we going to get out of this? And all of, what normally happens is the audience laughs. And you might have thought that, <laughs> that's quite funny, it's quite comical, because it's a bit slapstick. But it's incredibly stressful for the actors on stage because nobody really knows where to go with it next. Now, what the secret of, of offers and blocks is, is great improvisers are able to turn blocks back into new offers. So I'll, I'll try and give you an example. Good morning, Doctor. I'm not a doctor. Ah, well, actually, I'm not a patient either. 
I actually just dress up and walk around the hospital claiming to be sick and hoping that somebody gives me some free medicines. So basically you, you create this whole scene where you've got two imposters by virtue of the fact the improviser has taken a block and transformed it into a different story with different, a different offer. And that's from what I've learned, what makes a great improviser, separates good, good improvisers, sorry, great improvisers from good ones. And it's the same thing in, in agile teams. If you'd listen just on a typical day as to how many blocks you might hear compared to offers, and if you listen out, see if anyone's turning those blocks back into new offers. And you might find members of your team that are great collaborators because they're able to turn something negative into a positive and find a solution or find a way forward. In engineering terms, we as human beings prefer what we call yes, but. We prefer a blocking response, mainly because we like to, we're thinking about impediments and potential barriers to doing something. What's the problem with answering yes, but? Can you think of anything with any potential? You're, you're not uh, actually uh, agreed to the other person's right? Yeah, you're almost, it almost negates the, the positivity of yeah. the word yes, because you're following it with something as negative as, but you're wrong. Yes, but we don't do it like that. Yeah, but what about this? What about all these reasons why we can't do it? What about, you, what about that? And what about this? I mean, yeah, but that's not going to work. Yeah, but I'm sure there's a problem with this. It's just, just facially, in my facial expression, I'm frowning when I say the word but. So generally, it doesn't feel as positive. It doesn't tend to have as much of a positive outcome. Yeah. And it, do, it doesn't encourage other people to further contribute. No, to the offers, right? It shuts, shuts them, them down, down yeah. Away. Shuts them down straight away. Okay. So that's the, the basic notion of something called offers and blocks within improv. I'm going to ask you to put that together now into another little game we'll play. Um, and this is something we might do uh, if we can, Helen and Innes, we're in breakout rooms. So it'll work with smaller groups better. I'll, uh, I'll explain it first and, and you can I'll give you a bit of a, a heads up to try and... Um, work that, that through. But what we're going to do is we're going to put that notion of offers and blocks into, pardon me a minute, let's go back to sharing this. So into um, storytelling. So that spontaneity, that the offers based principle here, yes and, we're going to try and tie that into a little bit of storytelling now by virtue of a game that probably the simplest and easiest but equally the most fun game that I play is one word storytelling, okay? So we'll play this in small groups and we're gonna tell a story one word at a time by passing the story around a virtual circle as you go. But you'll be in small breakout rooms to do this, okay? If you feel you've reached the end of a sentence, just start a new sentence as you would do in normal speech, all right? But obviously you're only allowed to say one word at a time before the next person comes in. You kind of move in a uh, a repeating pattern and to try and make it easy to give you a bit of context for the story the first seven words you're going to start your stories with will be the day we went to the forest and then you carry on from that point onwards okay right we'll have a go how many have we got how many, there's 19 of us um we'll put people into some breakout rooms of around three or four people each would work helen um so we'll put you into some random rooms with some random people um and just decide on the order you're going to say your words in that's probably the most important thing to do so decide a number one two three or one two three four and then just repeat that cycle one word each no cheating no two words just one word and then we pass it on and see where your story goes by only adding one word at a time each. The day we went to the forest. Okay, any questions on the game before we get started? Any tips on, I assume we have to come back and tell our story. No, so, I'm, I'm not gonna force you to, just see where it goes. See I'm where just thinking about uh, scribing or remembering or. Uh, just go with it, go with, live, in, live in the moment, Mary, live in the moment. <laughs> All right, so we'll give it about five minutes and see how far your story gets. I mean, if, there's, if the story is total rubbish, you can literally just write it off and start again. I don't really mind. Um, if, if, you know, but try and just see how the, the story kind of transpires. Quick question, another question? 
Just a short one. Uh, Paul, is full stop um, a word or just start a new sentence? Uh, just yeah, just full stop. If it's not obvious, you can kind of go like that, or you, it will be just just downturn your voice and upturn it on the start of the next sentence. That's how I do it. But yeah, it'll be obvious. It'll be obvious. I'm not. It doesn't have to be grammatically perfect either. Don't worry about that. All right. <laughs> just see how it, see where it goes in five minutes. One word at a time. Right, um, Paul. I think you have the ability to break out. Oh, do I? Am I the only? Do I have the power? I'm afraid, yeah, you're the only person with the power. Sorry. All right, okay, I'll do that now. It's gonna, right, I can do that. It's going to be about three to four people per room. Um, it should do it automatically if Zoom's um, playing um, playing ball. I'll time it for five minutes. Just have fun with it. If it's total rubbish, write it off and start again. Good luck. Away you go. <laughs> cool, thanks. Cheers, Paul. Good. Coming back to see some smil smiling faces. That's always a good sign. Did you have fun? We did. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah, we did. So I don't just just because I'm nosy, just because don't feel you have to share us. But was there any interesting storylines emerged from those simple starting fr uh, words I gave you? Uh, the, repeatable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there certainly was from our side. I don't know if any PJ, Anna, Mary, you want to share. I've... Did it <laughs> we end had the, yeah, we had the band of elephants playing uh, banjos oh, and course. jumping around. After they died. <laughs> we, we had a band, we had a bird which died and then came back to haunt us. <laughs> Oh, that was a bit sinister. That's a bit dark. Okay. And there was some, and there was sudden rain. Rain. We had to, we had to run. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that sounds so depressing. <laughs> okay, good. Did, but you had a good time. That's the main thing. Oh, it was hysterical. <laughs> we Did nearly you... had a naked ast astronaut. Shoes <laughs> <laughs> and please wear something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you um? What was I going to, I was going to mention something else then. Did you notice offers and blocks? Words that were good offers and words that were, were blocks? Mm. Any of that? Even in one word, you can probably get across an offer. Um, so something, mm. like ast something like astronaut is a great offer because it gives you some, you know, it gives you, an, you can explore it you know, in any way, shape or form. You might have noticed people, what, what we call, what Keith Johnson would call stalling. Mm. So where, like a word that says like, it was big, hairy, scary and it, it, we want to know what it is we don't want to describe it anymore that's a, that's in effect a block a, some a way of blocking the next person because you're not giving them anything to work from so e we can even do that and practice that with just these simple little one word stories and it's amazing how positive just, just the way you might even say a word might take it in a much more positive direction by looking as a yes and rather than as a yes but it's amazing when you play those stories how many times we find death or you know, some kind of misfortune it tends to take on a very negative it was raining <sighs> yeah so it's like it, trying to keep things positive can be quite hard sometimes but well done well done for playing along with that um i did want to mention something a little bit more about storytelling um if I, am i still sharing this no i'm not right now uh bear with me a bit of theory around storytelling. It's big stuff at the moment, storytelling. You'll notice it in a lot of different agile um, blogs and, and, and uh, papers. And basically across business, storytelling is, is quite a powerful tool. And I wrote a, wrote a whole chapter on it in my book because I think it's a real good um, uh, way of, of increasing engagement. And I did a bit more research around storytelling as such. This is called um, Freitag's Pyramid, that you may not recognize. But what you will recognize is it's a very um, easy to follow story arc. Now, most Hollywood films follow this story arc. If there's a main character in the story, there's normally what you call the exposition up to rising action. The, the, some kind of something happens to the main character. The drama increases to some sort of climax and then it tapers off and you find some kind of resolution and then some new reality that that main character has experienced. Now that story arc comes from a, a, a play, a German playwright called Gustav Freitag, and he describes it's a way to increase emotional engagement between the audience and the main character. And I find that it's obviously it's what improvisers use use on stage a lot when there is no script. 
you can follow this arc and you'll get to the end of the story. But we can use it within Agile teams quite easily to help us increase engagement with our teams. Here's one example that I used it in. Um, this story spine on the left hand side here is basically a description of a simple story arc. And what I've done here is I've translated it into a sprint goal format. So instead of you know, just dishing out a load of product backlog items to a team in a planning session, I've started by, by telling them a story about a particular user who had a particular problem. Until now, this sprint, we can solve that problem and then at the end of the sprint, we'll be able to do these new things. The user will be able to solve that problem and get some kind of benefit. And the beauty of that is you leave the middle part of the story, the rising, the drama, to the team to work out. So you play the beginning of the story to the team, you tell them the end, the output, but what happens in the middle is up for grabs. And you can use the product backlogs there to- I get right. Okay, I'm scared now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so whoever that is, what, I don't think you realize that your uh, microphone is not on mute. And I would kindly request that you put it on mute. Thank you for that, because it's frightening to be at me. Um, yeah, so trying to let the team fill out the, the, the action in the middle part of that story, that can become their, their sprint backlog, their plans for the next sprint. It's quite a nice way of increasing engagement. And I talk a lot with, especially when I'm coaching and teaching product owners, to be the main storyteller in your, in your team. Okay, you've got to be able to get that story across um, quite effectively. And the, well, the better you tell it, the more engagement you'll get from your teams. Okay, not a lot long left. How long have I got? 13 or so minutes. All right. I'm going to quickly uh, give you a, a, a bit of an example of something called status. And we're going to play one game to, uh, to finish off in, uh, in my final chapter. So status. Oh, I haven't got time for that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't think that game was in there. It takes too long. Here's an example of what we call subtle status changes. changes. Hopefully you recognize these two characters from, from the silver screen. Can anyone tell me who they are? There's a clue at the bottom of the screen. Laurel and Hardy. Correct. Very good. Uh, Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy. Um, very much uh, famous actors uh, on black and white screen where there wasn't a lot of great script to work with. What Laurel and Hardy were very good at was small changes in their behavior that increased um, engagement uh, between the audience and these two characters. Very subtle. Now, in improv terms, we refer to status from two perspectives, high, high status and low status. And actors are generally told to try and assume one of those statuses on stage to increase the to change the relationship with their other actors, even if they're not saying anything. It's a good example of these two photos on screen. Can you tell me of the, the photograph top left here uh, that you can see? One of those actors is playing what you call high status. The other is playing low status. Which one's which? So Laurel will be playing the low state, the guy yeah. in the far, far left who's looking away. Yes. And then the more engaging Hardy is looking at you. So he's trying to be high status. Yes. So eye contact, in this case with the camera, tends to, is what a, an actor on stage would be told to do to increase their status, to heighten their status hold their, their gaze with the camera or with an audience member, whatever that is. Whereas uh, Stan Laurel is looking away. He's generally also a smaller character. He tends to make himself smaller on stage and Oliver Harley tends to make himself big. So their natural um, positions on stage tend to be Stan Laurel would be low, Oliver Harley would be high. Now what's happened in the second photograph here is what we call in improv terms, the status switch. And this is where you tend to get interesting storylines that emerge. You don't have to say anything. You just got to change your relationship. Can you see this? Can you see a slight status switch in the second photograph? Can you notice what's happened? And how do you, how do you instinctively detect that switch? What do you notice that's changed? Confidence in the posture. Yes, so posture has certainly changed. And you said the word confidence there. I'd, I'd say it's, it's probably more in terms of knowledge. 
superior knowledge can be high status. I know something that you don't. Kind of chin up and exposing the neck is very much seen as a kind of a, a high status, uh, look how great I am, a dominating stance. So actors are told that to basically manipulate how they look to change and to increase collaboration. Now, what's interesting to me is that status is always occurring in business, in, in our jobs, in our professional lives. And sometimes we're doing it, we're playing it without realising it. And it's much more of an instinctive thing that we might do in certain situations. If we feel scared, we might make ourselves smaller. If we feel nervous or apprehensive, we might make ourselves smaller. And as a facilitator, as a leader, it's probably being more aware of those subtle status changes that can allow you to approach your situation differently. Okay. And the Scrum Master role <clears throat> as a particular example for me is one which many people perceive as high status and give, you know, even developers that see their Scrum Masters as high status characters in their team, quite dominant, quite authoritative, quite bossy, maybe in some respects. Personally, I think a great Scrum Master is one that maybe tries to assume low status first and then adjusts from there. So how can I support this rather than how can I take over? I can see a few nods, which is nice, nice to see as well. Good. Don't, don't you want to also, though, exude confidence in, you know, even if it's confidence in the team by having positive body language? Yeah. And there might be times, Mary, when that's um, absolutely what you do need to do you know, in terms of if the team are perhaps fearful of taking on a new piece of work or perhaps, you know, there's a chain that's coming that, that we need to consider. We need to, you know, there's, and we can show safety by having a high status. We can increase safety. Mm, that's, yeah. yeah. So that might be deflecting, literally deflecting um, the nasty people away from us. I can, I, I will protect you here. I'll, I'll look after your team. I'll look after our interests here. That's much more of a high status approach, maybe to outside the team rather than to people within it. But yeah, a good example of it. Excellent example. OK, we've got a few minutes left. I just want to do um, my last chapter or my last element here, which is sensitivity. And then we're going to have a go at a bit of a game. Let's do this. Let's do the game first. This is called the three headed expert. You're just going to have to trust me on this. This is a game for me plus three volunteers. Now you've all been through now almost 45 minutes of me talking. You'll know the level of safety that we've already established here amongst ourselves. We're all friends, we're in a safe space. Um, but I am looking for three volunteers who'd like to play this game with me and have a go at this. Mary's put a hand up. I need to put you on gallery view because I can't see you all, unfortunately. I've got Anya, I've got Maru, and I've seen Mary. Are you happy to play the game? So I've got Anya, Anya, Anya <laughs> Mary, brilliant. We never normally get three volunteers that quickly. I won't lie to you. So um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. All right. Uh, the rules of the game are pretty simple. I'll, re I'll just read them out to you. How it works is the three of you are going to play the role of an expert being interviewed on a TV show and I'm going to be interviewing you. Now, the catch is you can only answer my questions one word at a time each. OK, so looking at just just going with the order that you appear on my screen and you, you're going to be word number one. OK. And then Maru, your word number two. And Mary, you'll follow with a third word, but it does recycle. So if we need more than three words, you keep going around the loop. So we are all the same person. You are all the same person. Your answers have to make sense. All right. There has to be. Good luck, quick. guys. Good luck. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so how we might do this, I'll tell you what, if you're, um, if you're a part of the audience now, if you're not Anya, myself, Mario, or Mar Mary, if you can turn your cameras off to create the illusion of the audience, that would be cool. cool. <laughs> the rest of us, we're on stage now, Mary, Mario. Ooh, right. scary. Now, um, so what we need, we'll shout out to the virtual audience here. We need a suggestion from the audience of uh, an animal, please. And someone's going to shout one out. Listen to this. Please, no elephant. I can't deal with elephants. <laughs> an audience, to this, shout out an animal, please. Unicorn. That's not a real animal. Sorry. Horse. Ma horse. I heard horse. I heard horse. Um, and from a different member of the audience, we need um, uh, an Olympic sport, please. Swimming. <laughs> swimming. Oh, who said swimming? Was that Maru? 
It doesn't count. Sorry, I was just remembering. From the audience only, please. Scene. Fencing. 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 Yes. Fencing. Good Olympic sport. Nice, unusual Olympic sport. But you're in luck, audience, because tonight, for one night only, we have an expert in horses that can fence at an Olympic standard. Very well pleased to welcome here in front of you tonight, Dr. Robinson. So give a round of applause to Dr. Robinson. It's great to have you here, Dr. Um, firstly, to tell us, it's a fascinating thing. How did you get involved in, in, in horses that could, you know, just training horses for an Olympic standard? That's incredible. Well. Love. Conquers. It's. Yes, I can. I can agree. It does love. Love. It's a great. It's a very profound statement, and a little quite, quite not very specific. But so let's get into the into the real nitty gritty of this. Tell us how you got started with with this um, obscure profession. When I was a child, a <laughs> <laughs> prisoner. Oh. I I felt the <laughs> need for horses. <laughs> Was that to escape to to get out of of, of prison? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Try <Trying> to think. <laughs> Trying to think of yes and, Andy. I'm trying to think of yes and, okay? So that's fine. Uh, but go, go on. No, so um, we will stay away from the prison story because it's, it's quite dark. But um, I know there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, stories around that. But tell it, tell the audience will be fascinated with this. What is it about... So how does a horse hold a... It's not called a sword, is it? Is it an epee? Okay. Well, how do they hold that? Tell us more about that. that. Um... <laughs> Interesting. Uh, special. Inve invention. That. Toe. The <laughs> that toe. The mm. ho horse toe. I mean, yeah. Horse. Sorry. Horses have toes, of course. Go on, Mary. <laughs> Struggling with the English. Okay. So do you do you strapping? Do you, okay, right. So this special event. Post strapping. Is, you strap it to the horse's hoof. I think is the word you were thinking of. Does you strap it to the horse's hoof? Is that right? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Okay. And um, we're we've got really got to finish now because we are pressed for time. But what I um. What I enjoyed about you, I know you've got a book out. I know it's coming out just in time for Christmas. I really did enjoy reading it. But what I thought was quite powerful was your the poem that you wrote right at the end of, of chapter four. Could you, if you'd just like to maybe give us the first line of that poem before we finish. Love. <sighs> right. Now. That it? And yeah. <laughs> Beautiful non-rhyming poem there. Well done. Give yourself a round of applause and the rest of us can turn our cameras on. The audience is a standing ovation for our, our three-headed expert there. Well done. Well done. Uh, Thank you for playing, Anya. Thank you, uh, and Maru and Mary. Uh, it's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Why was it difficult? Because you want the sentence to go one way and it goes the other and then you have to... <laughs> yeah, adjust... Yeah. You have ideas in your head and then they throw in a word and you think, oh, I can't use that. What can I say now? Yeah. Then? And it's being, the rest being of the folks. just rolling with it. Wherever it goes, if it's a word you don't even understand, you've got to go with it. Um, yeah. Like, like horse toe. Having toes. <laughs> Who knows? Have toes. So it's incredible. I've, I've learned something today. If no one else has, it's incredible. Um, no, but um, what's interesting about improv is that we can still, the responsibility for creativity doesn't, doesn't lie with us. And I could see Maru there just, just hesitating a little bit when the, the most, sometimes it's just doing the obvious thing and it could just be a word like the. 
adding a word in that connects another word. And that might be my part in this process throughout, but I'm allowing other people's flow to improve if I can just connect those words quicker. And we don't have to be creative all the time. It's not, you know, it's, we don't have to be in that mode all the time. Sometimes we've just got to allow the ideas to be connected a bit quicker. All right, That's, but great, well done. Well done on that, on that uh, regard. Um, just a couple of slides for me to finish off, then I'll take any questions that you've got. Because um, I know that I, I don't want to eat into your evenings too much. So that was Three-Headed Expert. This is what I call being in the moment. This is what sensitivity is all about in my, in my book. And improvisers talk about being in the moment on stage, where they are literally switched on to whatever is happening around them. Almost they can blot out the audience. They're completely in tune with everything else that's going on with their fellow actors on stage. And it's that type of heightened sensitivity that we might, we might need to, at certain points, probably not on, on, a, on a continuous basis, but improvisers exercise these muscles much more regularly. Things as simple as listening and memory skills and observational skills, they do without much thought and they just pull ideas, not even a new idea, just a previous idea, and they can recall it and reuse it much more efficiently. So there we go, that's your five elements of improvisational principles. Um, safety, spontaneity, storytelling, status and sensitivity. Um, if you are interested, I've got, I'm running, what I've done since lockdown is created an online version of the book. So we basically run um, a five week course with 90 minutes uh, per week where you get to run some of those games for each chapter across five weeks, five chapters, five weeks. I've done two versions so far since lockdown started. They went really well. So I'm going to do another one in the new year. If you're interested, I can't remember the dates. It's something like the 7th of January for five weeks on a Thursday or something. But if you are interested, have a look at my website, which has been behind me all the time. Um, and yeah, have a look on the website. The dates are on there if you are interested. If you want to come and have a try at some of the other games that I, uh, I play around with. But uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for playing and thank you... Um, for joining in. It's great to see so many cameras on with these things. It's nice to know I'm not alone. So um, any, I'll take any questions if that's all right, Helen, is it? Do you want to do a few questions? Anything wants, people want to ask? Yeah, that'd be great if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. You can either shout your questions out or pop them in the chat. I have a question. So playing these games with your teams, scrum teams or whatever, is it to then say to them, you know, <clears throat> you could, you know, like with the last game, would it be to exactly explain what you're explaining to us? Sometimes it's good just to be the connector. Sometimes it's, you know, would, would you actually do that? Or is it just a way of building, you know, team building to use an old I term think, and building? No, yeah, I think different types of games for different, different uh, stages or different um, scenarios. But I think, what I've found from training a lot over the years is that regardless, I can play the same game for the same team and they would bring different things out of it than they would do from one month to the next, just depending on what's going on for that team at that particular time. Some games, I, I agree, are, are much more focused, like a game like Anyone Who is very much focused around safety and trying to get people comfortable with sharing things that they, I feel they're not sharing. So that's perhaps a bit more explicit and a bit more, a um, bit more closed. But some games are quite open. You can, and sometimes they're just a bit of fun, just a bit of light relief. But sometimes they can actually uncover genuine um, issues or, or, or dysfunctions that they don't even realise that they're going through at that time. And then sometimes it's nice just to get that feedback from a team and see, but what did you make of that? Was that of use for you? Did you find any anything useful about yourself within that game? Courses for courses. Yeah, I th but I think the more, that's why I've always said that the first, and I've put the chapter one on my, my book was safety. You've got, if you've got established that sense of safety, the other games become a lot more powerful because people feel a lot more free to open up emotionally about their situation, their part in the team, whatever it might be. Good question there, Mary. Any other questions? So how do you how do you plan how do you use this with teams completely? What kind of scenarios do you 
Yes, this how, do use, how do we use these games? Yeah, I mean, all of I guess there is much more in these games in the book. So I mean, oh, all... many more. Um, no, but I so I've I've always tried to make obviously in my term I'm a big scrum coach and a big scrum fan, and I've always tried to um, coach teams from from a safety point of view first. So for me, from a scrum point of view, the safest place should always be a retrospective. So that would be the place where I felt this was the safest place to even play a game or like this. You've got to bear in mind, of course, when even as I'm sure some of you will have, 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 um, have felt that when we started this, that I'm going to be made to look a fool with this, with this, I'm, you know, improvs for actors, for really talented people. I'm not a talented, imaginative person. So it can create a bit of fear around that. So if you can um, set the set the stage, literally, um, about the safety element of this, this is just a game. It's not real life. If it's no good, we won't do it again. But let's do you want to explore this this type of play scenario in, in that type of way. The more t teams I've, I've coached to get used to the idea of playing together, that tends to be where create more creative um, time comes from when we feel like we're when there's less stress on winning and losing on succeeding or failing. This is just about playing together and learning together. So I think we can do a lot to set some degrees of safety, even around the games itself and our relationship and, and, and in not judging people's performance on this. But the expected benefit of these games are, are I mean, better collaboration or what, what, what kind of uh, benefits do the teams have from this? I think um, regularly. So I think if you're doing these things on a regular basis, you can see I've seen teams that are more open to uh, collaborating more freely, more open to challenging each other's um, status, possibly. Um, certainly creating things in planning sessions more freely, exploring new ideas more freely. Um, but from a personal point of view, if you're looking at this as an individual, I've benefited from um, presentation skills, from kind of communication skills, uh, listening skills, observation skills, all things that are great as a, an individual, as a coach, I feel I use, I'm using actually improv, I'm using yes and a lot more than I ever thought I would need to, just as a coach, trying to answer people, using it as an example, as a coach, by repeating back exactly what someone has said and offering my, um, my thoughts or my uh, observation on it, I am in truth, I'm, I'm yes anding that, that suggestion. I'm yes anding that offer from my client or from my, um, my, my uh, coachee in that case. Anna, did you want to add something? Oh, you're on mute again. Sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, I played a yes and game two years ago and I realized I'm a very logical person and I'm great in team to find out uh, issues or possible risks. Yeah. And that is a good treat, but I am teaching myself to express myself differently, to support people, but still raise the risks. Yeah. So I'm not saying anymore, yes, but I'm actually rephrasing and in my emails, changing buts into ends yeah. and saying the same thing, but rephrasing it. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And that's how this yes end game actually influenced me when I first played it. That's great. Yeah. So thanks for that, Anna. Yeah, it's very much... And yeah, but very clear to say it's not that yes, but or, or block is, is a bad thing. Even improvisers use blocks to get laughs and, and to, you know, to change the dynamic. But it's being able to recover. If you're constantly being blocked, you won't want to work with that improviser. Yeah, it's about being prepared to, to adapt. Good. Thanks, Anna. And thanks, Mary. Any other questions? I just throw a comment out there. Oh, uh, just just one thing, uh, Paul. Can you give us maybe an example? Let's say from one of those uh, items, like for example, safety from you know from where you coach your teams. Can you give us a, an example how you used it? Yeah, I'll try. Um, so played it with a team. I won't name who it is because that's not fair. But um, scrum team played anyone who at the end of a sprint and. It kind of you could tell that the the game was increasing in kind of just some of the pauses between people thinking about what they're going to say, 
and it got to a stage where um so one of the developers said anyone who's ever had to come in at the weekend and fix a problem they made on friday and so that that became clear there was a bit of a jaw drop because they didn't realize that had happened for this particular developer they could clearly see and i could see this developer was quite upset about it and quite um traumatized you know, but traumatized by it they, they, they felt quite upset and quite embarrassed but what happened was i think maybe two other people more senior people in the team put their hand up and say yeah i've done that and then they, that that gave the permission for those three it didn't happen in that in that session but what i think after in the coffee break afterwards though you saw though i saw those three people talking about the scenario he just had a chance to explain it and get that off his chest that he felt terrible about it but in fact when he realized that two of the most senior people in the team say oh yeah i've done that loads i've screwed up on a friday and tried to come in and fix it the weekend and made it and just kind of gave them a bit of safety that you know it happens to all of us you know but in truth we can whatever happens we can probably fix it it's not a big deal because we've all done it mm. and that's so it was a bit more subtle and it probably wasn't directly part of the game but it just gave that person the opportunity to share something that they perhaps wouldn't have shared in an ordinary retrospective that easily. That's that's one that sticks in my head, certainly. Thanks. No worries. Okay. Unless there are any more questions, I know that everybody is uh, probably either very hungry or very tired or just one last you. one last question yeah. for Paul. Paul, are you giving away any discounts? <laughs> <laughs> no. yes. And write me an email and I'll see what I can do. There you okay. go. Right. Yes, and that I can't say no now. Now you put me in a position where I can't say no. Very clever, Anya. Wait until the end of the course of the call to ask me a question I can't say no to. Genius. Okay. Drop me a line, Anya, and we'll see what we can do. I just wanted okay. to make a comment about um, how nice it is the fact that, you know, sometimes in all this agile uh, talk, people really concentrate in the tools and the specifics. And you just show us how it doesn't matter how the environment change. You can use what you have yeah. to support the purpose. Um, so that's the, from the beginning, I was like, wow. You know, we, we need to help each other to, to look at things like this more often and, you know, valuing that individuals and interactions over the particularities and tools. So. Exactly, yeah. And it's just nice to reconnect with people. And, and improv is all about people. It's all about humans and, yeah, trying to uh, and be, just just get the most out of... And what, um, what a lot of the improvisers said to me, it's kind of an improv principle, really, that they live by is, I enjoy l l watching other people look good, making other people look good. And if you're the type of person that does enjoy seeing other people do well, it's not always about yourself. You're a selfless person. In my eyes, you're going to be a great improviser and you're going to be a great agile teammate to, to be with. So, uh, yeah, that's why that's why, how I look at it. Just some feedback. One of the guys that we work with, Michael O'Donnell, he attended the course and he loved it. So he was like, go do it, go do it. So he yeah. really loved it. And he's like a big chap and he's sometimes yeah. quite quiet. So he loved it. Like he was raving about it. So uh, hence we're all, <laughs> that's why we're all here. <laughs> so I'll see you in, in, in January, Sharon. Yeah, I'll see, yep. see you on my course as well. Good stuff. And Savar's been on my course as well, so she can say, she's um, commented as well, how great it is. So it'd be nice. To, it's, you're all welcome. You're all welcome. And, um, yeah, it's not a paid promotion, but I absolutely enjoyed it and recommend it from the bottom of my heart. I didn't, I didn't ask these people to turn up, by the way. They turned up of their own. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thanks, Savar. Okay, excellent. I'll uh, try again. If <laughs> everybody has, uh, thank you so much, everyone, I guess, for coming. And thank you, Paul. It's been really great. I mean, the comments that have come through are just brilliant. You've made it such an interesting session, and I'm, I've definitely taken a lot away from it. So no thank you ever so much. I will just share one last thing because we like to be good in our way that we receive feedback and always continuously improve every session that we have. And we hope that the feedback that you do give us for people who are returning, you see that we're starting to, you know, get better and better. So um, I'm just going to pop 
this uh, this link in the chat right now, and it would be great to hear your thoughts, the goods, the bads, the anything really. Um, uh, I just one second have lost my chat. There you go, boom. Um, so if you'd be so kind as to fill that out, so we can continuously improve and make this um, even better for you guys. So thank you so much, and thank you, Paul, and everybody else has joined us tonight, and we'll hang around for a few more minutes. If you want. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, dog, see you later, dog. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>